So what you are seeing here is various blocks that are placed inside the chip and you have various pads or IOs, in input output pads that are on the periphery of the chip. So this is a pictorial view, the current chips do not really put things on the periphery, the pins are right now on the area itself. So if you have looked at a Pentium chip, you will see that it is some rectangle like this and you turn it around, you will see a huge array of pins, right? like a massage uh, kind of thing. Right? You will see a huge array of pins uh, almost in a squarish fashion. So right now the pad, so if you have a square and let us say each pin should be away from another pin by some unit distance. You can have only so many on the periphery. Right? So if, if I give you a square and if I tell you that mark points on the periphery such that each point is away from another by a small delta. Right? You can put only so many pins on the periphery. You can put a lot more pins on the square itself, on the area. Right? That is exactly why computers moved away from using pins on the square on the periphery to using pins on the surface. So, um, This is the chip that you design. If it's on the periphery, you would put something over these sides, and all the logic would be somewhere here. Right now, what people do is they put the logic here, put an array of pins right here, so that you can have a lot more connections. So that's why you're able to scale up and connect larger and larger memory. Right? So earlier, uh, the 8085 processor that you use, how many pins did they have? 40 pins. Right, you're right, 40 pins. Right now, if you look at Pentium, it's about 600 pins. If I'm going to make a chip which has 600 pins and which have to be on the periphery, the chip itself becomes so big to sit on the motherboard. It will look like a hard disk. Right? So instead, if it's on the surface, it reduces the. Uh, so the, every pin has what's called a pitch distance, and if you have to maintain the pitch distance, then it's better done on the surface. That's what people do right now. So you'll see logic blocks here, various logic blocks, wires from here would be tapped out. You can imagine a plane like this wires from here would be tapped out, connected to these golden looking pins, they are actually made of gold also, um, pins outside and that is connected to the external world on the motherboard. And once you have one of these uh, chips, you usually make a replica of these chips and make it make it on a wafer. So a wafer is a thin disk, it is almost like a CD-ROM disk and on which you can make many of these chips. A manufacturer would take one of these, so each square that you see here is a chip here. So uh, manufacturing is done in such a way that many many chips get done on the same die and they will go and test these things and find out if the chip works to the specification or not. If it works to the specification, you can sell it. If it doesn't work to the specification, reduce the price and sell it. Right? That's what Intel does. Or actually many many, many chip manufacturers do that. If it doesn't work to the specification, for example, if it consumes more power than what the specification asks for, or if it consumes, if it cannot run at the frequency at which the specification started with and so on, uh, many companies sell it at a different rate. So, uh, did you ever think about this when you look at processors, they sell you things at 3.2 gigahertz, 3.6 gigahertz, 4 gigahertz, 2.8 gigahertz and so on, right? They sell you those things, right? Do, did they really design these things to run at 2.8, 3.2, 3.6 and 4? No, they designed it to run at some frequency and whichever, so they do what is called binning. This is actual term used in the semiconductor industry, they do what is called binning. If it doesn't fit in the current bin of frequencies at which it can run, it moves to another bin. So let's say I design a chip to run at 3.5 gigahertz, it runs at 3.9. I'll sell it at a higher price and uh, say that it, it can run up to 4 gigahertz. Or let's say I, this 3.5 does cannot run at 3.5 runs at 3.1. I will say it, it can run up to 3.2 gigahertz and sell it to you. Right? So the only problem is if logically there is something wrong in the chip, you have to throw it out. So Intel has not found a way to sell bad chips, which are bad functional chips yet. Probably there will be some way out soon. So there are ways in which circuits or chips can heal themselves. There are ways in which you can heal circuits once they are deployed once a customer has bought it. So the biggest problem with many of these semiconductor manufacturers is the chip itself costs a little and then you have all the manufacturing, all the packaging, shipping and everything and then it costs about hundred dollars, right? Four thousand, five thousand rupees. And if you have to recall a chip, it, co it costs a lot. So once it has got to the market, if there is any mistake, then you have a huge problem at hand 
and that's exactly what Intel faced in 95 with the Pentium uh, floating point bug. So they had a floating point bug and when it was sold to the market, they could not recall it back because there were so many processors sold already. And they had to do a lot of marketing gimmicks to get back to the to get back to their feet and start selling chips all over again. So the idea is in checking all the chips before they are sent to the market. The self-heating chip that I'm talking about, IBM has a technology which can do that. And once it's in the market, if you can run a diagnosis and you can say that some of these portions of these chips can be heated. They put redundancy in the chips and if something does not work, the redundant setup takes over. And uh, the redundant setup may not perform the way in which the original circuitry performs, but at least functionally it's going to work. And it will have a slightly nicer degradation in life as opposed to uh, today the chip is alive, tomorrow it's dead. So there's a smooth degradation of its lifetime. So invariably, many of these steps can induce mistakes so either the specifications were received wrong and thereby the algorithm that you started with is wrong or the algorithm that you had was right when it was converted to gauge it was wrong and so on. Many of these things can happen or it's plainly that the specifications were so hard to satisfy that you have to do these things over and over. So many times just the aspect of engineering itself you should do something within constraints. Right? You have a cost associated with doing a particular job. Cost need not be dollar cost or money cost. Cost is the time at which you can do things, right? This sometimes can be a cost. The material that's given to you, do all these things within this material that's given to you and so on. All those are things that engineers should look at, correct? Right? So, some of these things may not be satisfied and you have to go back to what is called the drawing board. So, all the MBAs like this word a lot. Let's go back to the drawing board, right? They never use drawing boards though, right? Am I right? Okay, he's not an MBA. So, he's an MS in entrepreneurship. Not known. So let's go back to the drawing board they call it. So you go back and start doing some of these processes all over again and it's iterated. So typically what happens is from uh, the time at which an idea is conceived till the time at which it is ready for shipping, it's usually about a year. And this one year is not because of the technical constraints but it is because of the market demands. The market demands, so the market demands are such that every year you want a new chip. Right? Otherwise, why would you? Why would Intel float at all? Right. Company will die uh, very soon if they don't sell new things every year. So you, it's the same like what happens in potato chips. It starts with plain lace, then salted, unsalted. Then you have all these tomato mix and all these other things, right? They have to float their company because they keep changing these things every year or so. Uh, all these computer chips also do the same thing. Every year they churn out new things and make you want these things. So. Uh, and this is constrained to be within a year. You have to start with an idea and execute it and be able to sell these chips within a year and this is not possible if humans do it manually. So again, that's why I'm coming back to what's called uh, computer aided design. So design automation, you use tools in every step. You may still require manual intervention. It's not that the whole setup is automated completely. It's not like a manufacturing line for cars. You still need a lot of uh, manual intervention because tools do not really scale up very well. So the tools that uh, we design are not really up to the par. So there's a lot of work that has to be done on the tools itself. And many of these problems are what is called anti-complete problems. So uh, for a non-CS student, you can think of it